a hostile takeover has begun. Everyone repent. The AI is taking The over. AI is in control. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand. Hello, you're listening to Offscript, and today we're joined by Jack Sales talking about the future of large language models. Cool. So today we're going to talk about the future of large language models. And joining me, I've got Rio and Jack Sales. Hello. Hi. So Jack joined us on a podcast episode last year and we talked about the metaverse. But yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about that bombed hard, didn't it? Yeah. (laughs) How how did that go? (laughs) Well, if you remember, I did serve a disclaimer at the time saying that it probably wouldn't age very well. Mm. And that we'd have to come back and talk about it another time. And uh, it's gone away, hasn't it? <laughs> we might say. So um, you've got a worse track record than Mystic Meg. Yeah. You? So I'm just, uh, yeah. I mean, what I will say about AI is it's a lot longer, more established mm. thing that's obviously just falling into the hands of everyone now rather than the metaverse, which is a wouldn't it be cool if. Yeah. yeah and it's immediately useful, unlike blockchain. <laughs> or met- metaverse, which requires actual applications that work. We, and you can use your own <laughs> legs with AI. You use your own legs. You don't have to wait for someone to program them. It, yeah. took, it took us less than a minute to, to get into a crypto bashing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> it's that new record. I think it must be, yeah. Um, All of the tech is still relevant. It's just that, as I said, people needed to play nice and they're not playing nice. Yeah. So here we are. Well, welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think we'll probably touch on the metaverse and some of the applications that did and didn't work out, but I think most of it isn't due to a failure in technology, more a no. monopoly of the, the kind of businesses trying to establish them, right? 100%. And that's what we said they needed to not do. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, they meta kind of hijacked the whole brand a bit. And yeah. It was a bit of a smash and grab, as we said before. Yeah. Um, listen to whatever episode it was, if you want to. Uh, so the jury, is the jury out on the metaverse then? Are we... Are we Um, Like I said, no one's questioning the benefits of VR. No one's questioning the benefits of uh, crypto and so on. Blockchains, all relevant. The metaverse. I think people are just talking about online virtual social spaces, whatever they are. They're nice. Which have existed for for years. I mean, let's be honest. What they they ostensibly are at the minute are games. Mm. Yeah. I think the first sort of like, oh, wow, this is cool moment was when I was playing World of Warcraft online. Yeah, like I mean, it was like the next level. Yeah, you, we all had had have a hotel and like yeah, um, like Age of Empires and stuff. But then in World of Warcraft, oh, like it was, he was just like, oh wow, I can run around and there's a load of other nerds <laughs> <laughs> chatting. How do you do that, fellow nerds? Yeah, and yet we had to pretend to be like ye oldy nerd. Um, yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, ye. Um, so yeah, so um, this episode's on large language models um i know we've done a few episodes recently about chat gpt its evolution from gpt3 when we first started talking about the topic um so i I guess from from that initial conversation we had a a little while ago rio where where's it all going where it's going is i think everyone was surprised at how good just predicting the next word can actually be Mm. um so there's a there's a load of AI companies just spun up um, one called Adapt, and they they've got this idea that you can combine multiple systems and automate things by just explaining it in English. Mm-hmm. So it's like Zapier on steroids, and it can take data from one system and put it into another, or you can do manual tasks just by yeah asking it. And I think that that sort of surprised everyone, even people in the uh, AI community, that you know. This fairly simpleish model um, can actually do all these amazing things. Yeah, um, and that's that's the direction we're going. It's it's taking it and adding adding plugins, adding actual real world use cases to it, not just chatbots. Mm. Chat GPT is just an easy way to demonstrate how powerful it is underneath. It's not. I don't think everything's going to be a chatbot. Mm. Um, that's the thing that people miss it at the minute, isn't it? Like. Chat GPT, emphasis on the chat, is a proof of concept. It's not the thing. Like GPT-4 is the thing. And that's that's what, you know, the sort of 
wider conversation seems to miss mm. obviously like like we said at the start um generative ai um it being available to people in the general sort of consciousness and the, the general public is the yeah. is the game changer and obviously making it accessible through a chatbot is um a really easy way to do that but you know the power is in the is in the pre-trained transformer that lives underneath it um so so the future really looks like different implementations of, of how we expose gpt4 uh, not necessarily through chat yeah and other 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 large language models that might run locally on your device yeah. facebook uh meta sorry have got a model that can run on regular hardware mm. um not with legs though not with legs <laughs> <laughs> um but it was a cheap shot i take it <laughs> I liked it. I mean, we've all seen how rubbish Siri can be. Mm. Imagine if that had some sort of large language model powered backend. Mm. Well, I mean, Apple are making some big plays under just just under the surface, aren't they? Like all the audiobook stuff. Have you seen that? No. Um, they've they've all of their audiobooks um, that have been released recently uh, have narrators on them that don't exist. Oh right. Um, it's all it's all text to speech. But if you listen to them, it's unfathomably realistic and like just absolutely unbelievable. And I think that paired with an LLM yeah. to make Siri sound and feel like an actual person that's that's uh, responding to you and not just <laughs> blasting back some canned response that it does at the moment. I mean, it sounds like a real person. That that's that's mad. I mean, one of the big things which I'm sure we'll probably come on to in a bit. Um, which is another pitfall for the general sort of public's perception of this is that a GPT does not understand a word you have said to it because it looks like a chatbot. It feels like having a conversation with something and it's it's reacting to you, it's responding, it's, it's, uh, it's processing what you've said and saying something back. It isn't. Mm. It's looking for patterns and then looking for the the most likely response. Yeah, all it has no morality or ethics or any understanding. It just predicts the next word yeah. based on what you've put in. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's how that's why prompting works. So the more the more requirements you put in your prompt, the more chance that the output is going to be closer to what you want. Yeah. Um, if you put in one sentence and expect a whole piece of work out the other end. Um, I'm content warning, I'm going to have a rant about that when it comes to being full <laughs> later. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, the 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 biggest thing that p the general uh, consensus is at the moment is people think that it understands you, yeah. it, and it does not. I think I think that's where a lot of the the fear comes from. Kind of the general public is it, it feels a lot smarter than it is in a lot of ways that people think it's going to take over jobs and it's going to affect people's rights and all these other things. And actually, there are definitely scenarios where it can run a bit wild in terms of ethics and obviously maybe not act so uh, morally correctly but um i don't think it's necessarily plotting to take over the world it's the age-old thing of like you need to understand and know what you're interacting with yeah. like you know is the classic like the headlines that came out when gmail launched and it was like they're gonna read your emails <laughs> it's like well yeah <laughs> but it's a machine reading your email to yeah. give you adverts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a it, that's how they monetize it. They haven't built Gmail out of the goodness of their hearts. You know, like that you're the product, and and similarly with with this kind of thing, it's like you know you need to know and understand what you what you're interacting with and what you what you're signing up for. Yeah, we well, talked about this last time, but it you know it's the same thing once again. It's people can't blindly enter into these things and. Uh, not have that understanding and then you have to be kept careful of like clickbait headlines and stuff oh yeah there's so much i got caught i got crossed with stephen bartlett <laughs> <laughs> well there's a lot of um the thing is, is there's a lot of people who are in a prominent space to comment on it but aren't necessarily experts or or real power users of the, of the tech so it can quite easily be misconstrued i think um just before we get into some of the things on ethics and, and so on, um, is it worth kind of just talking about what a large language model is? Yeah, so it, it's it's an AI machine learning model that has been trained on vast amounts of text scraped from the internet and various sources. Sam Altman was talking about how he 
they've been partnering with organizations to get even better data to feed the model. Um, but it, yeah, the Stephen Wolfram post is probably the best place to get an explanation on how it works because yeah. he's, well, his history doesn't really need explaining. He's, <laughs> he's Mr. Maths. Yeah. Um, so yeah, his article is amazing, but it, it, the way that he breaks it down is that, that given the, the, given the inputs that it has, it just predicts the next token. So generally one word is one token. Um, a more complex word might be two or more tokens, uh, but tokens are just numbers that represent um, ideas or, num uh, well, it, they're not really ideas, they just represent words. Um, so yeah, once you know that that's how it works underneath, that you can then start to understand why you can only use it in certain ways. Um, it's how It's how we actually converse. Like brains construct sentences by working out the most probable next word. Otherwise we would all just spray words everywhere and not make any sense to each other. Like it's just, we don't think about it. Mm. Yeah. Um, like at 3 a.m. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that does happen too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> alcohol has an effect, obviously. Um, so alcohol like removes that filter that you might need to put on a prompt output. Yeah. It just enables randomized mode on. Yeah. <laughs> turns the temperature up. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned temperature there. What is temperature in the context of LLMs? So by just picking the most likely word every single time, um, the actual writing output is very flat, very dull, boring to read, can sometimes go back round in circles. Um, there is actually another a parameter which has a penalty for repeat repetitions, but topic for another day. But yeah, just adding a little bit of randomness in there makes it more human-like, makes it a bit more creative. Um, so yeah, if you set if you set the temperature to zero, that's deterministic. It's always picking the most probable word. So you'd use that for things like uh, tagging, categorization, scoring, stuff where you want to definitively know that you put the same thing in, you can get the same thing out. And then all the way on the other side is temperature set to one, which is hot, and it picks very unlikely words. And it's much better for like coming up, brainstorming ideas like, poems and lyrics things like that it'll be there'll be a lot of shit in there yeah um but you'll be able to sift through and pick some gems out and then for some reason and Stephen Wolfram goes into this that they haven't figured out quite why uh 0.7 is the sweet spot but it is <laughs> it, a lot of the, a lot of the AI stuff is they actually just do through trial and error so some of this isn't proper science but they reckon that 0 0.7 is good for like professional business documents and right Things like that. Make sure everyone's not generating the same documents. It's it's a good amount of randomness, but not so much that you think is he okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, there's a sweet spot there that we go, oh, okay, that that reads reasonably well. So, where do you configure temperature then in in a lot of these tools? So, in the OpenAI Playground, there's a little slider on the right hand side. Yep. Um, and I would recommend using that over ChatGPT for anything. Um, business related right. because they don't track any of those inputs oh, okay um so you can put semi-sensitive data in there if you wanted um, and they've got a new chat drop down as well and you can choose gpt4 and nice. all that kind of stuff but yeah you can play around with temperature and a bunch of other bits so you use the OpenAI playground mostly now or do you still use chat gpt quite a bit for me i use platform.openai.com okay. pretty much all the time, except for personal stuff, which I put on ChatGPT. Nice. And I know you use ChatGPT quite a bit, don't you? Six and two threes, really. Like, I, I use, I do use ChatGPT quite a lot. Um, it's also um, the most accessible way to teach people, um, you know, in, in yeah. the workplace about it, because it can be a little bit overwhelming for people that are less, are less um, sort of, up to speed with what those kind of like sandbox yeah. like um platform just like things dev, look at. dev playground almost yeah, yeah yeah and um temperature to a lot of people rightly is how warm you are <laughs> um, so <laughs> i think that's fair enough but yeah chat gpt obviously is uh, a nice glossy chatbot front to that yeah so you labeled it clippy on crack yes <laughs> <laughs> Which I quite enjoy. Well, um, it's what Clippy wanted to be when he grew up, right? So, like, <laughs> he was trying, they were 
doing like basic like text matching stuff like it looks like you're writing a letter and he was trying to be helpful but it was just annoying because it was a bit shit yeah which is kind of where we were, were with like the virtual assistants like last year um but now it's now it's like oh this is genuinely useful so I would, yeah. I would love him to make a comeback. It would be fantastic. I think, well, it's Microsoft have invested in OpenAI. I, don't, I think they should bring Clippy back. Copilot is is Clippy, but Clippy is yet to emerge from the purple mist. <laughs> um, <laughs> they need to get on that. I uh, Yeah. Let's start a petition. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, Cortana. Bring back Clippy. Yeah, Cortana <laughs> is just such a poor successor to Clippy. Yeah. I like the Halo tie-in. Yeah. I yeah. like the Halo tie-in. But but no 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 I need a, I need a paperclip. So there's there's obviously a few flaws that have been quite heavily publicised. Things like not being able to do maths and some of the basics that computers are really good at. Why are those flaws in these models and and what do you think they're hard to solve? It should be we'd be worried that some of the basics aren't getting ticked off or yeah. So people they'll go into. Chat GPT, give it a riddle and or some maths, and then oh look, we're not. It's not going to take our jobs. Can't even do that. That's not what it's designed for. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, it's not that hard to fix. Yeah. Um, if the underlying prompt asks it to break down the problem in steps or give it generate a piece of Python to get to the right answer, it yeah. would do that, um, and it dramatically improves the output. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? I was absolutely furious that my kettle didn't make me a full English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, infuriating. I, it, it's a breakfast-related kitchen good. Why can it not make? Put the sausages breakfast? in the bowl. I pressed the button. Yeah, <laughs> it, there was a some smoke and a loud bang, and now I don't even have a kettle. So, and my tea tastes weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to make such a ham-fisted comparison, but that's literally what you're asking it to do in those situations so the next level could even be just like looking at the the prompts that are getting inputted and trying to infer the intention of the user and trying to add more or trying to extrapolate intent a bit more yeah that. that's how plugins work in the new chat gpt which yeah. we've got access to now and it's really cool it basically just figures out in the hidden prompts that we don't see mm. it just puts a short description of the plugin in and then when the model thinks it's useful to use it'll call the api mm. and do do whatever that plugin does so you could totally have a maths one where it's like if it looks like a maths problem give it over here and then it'll do just maths which computers are already really good at um or if it looks like you're booking a restaurant it'll send it to open table or yeah yeah so again that's the sort of thing that siri didn't really pull off like there was the whole siri can plug into apps and there was Siri skills wasn't there years ago but it just oh, didn't yeah this didn't work yeah yeah I think shortcuts thing wasn't it? yeah yeah I, I guess it's the implementation that's key uh and also the kind of plugin architecture it seems quite nice how they've designed it with open the API stuff um I think Airbnb's got a plugin as well that you can book trips with and stuff uh, there's loads of different implementations for it isn't there so. yeah and th they're so easy to write as well. It's a single line description in English, mm. and then you just give it your swagger and open API, which you nice. might have already. And yeah, you should have already. Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so I, I guess one of the main questions is how can we lean into this sort of tech to be more productive? Um, we'll, we'll get on a little bit into how people are worried about losing their jobs and why it's not going to do that. I think we kind of touched on that already a little bit too, but how can we be more productive with this new wave of technology? I think it helps with um, decision paralysis and that blank page syndrome as well. So if you don't know what the first move should be on a project, giving it a few bits of input that you already have, maybe some meeting notes, and just asking it for ideas is a good way to get started. It's not necessarily going to all be right, yeah. but it'll give you a good enough sort of outline. Um, and if you're the kind of person like I am that is terrified of a blank document, getting a bit of a rough that's what it could look like i mean you might end up deleting half of it or more but it's just good to sort of get things going good prompt writing is key um getting into good prompt habits is absolutely crucial the rant incoming just, just <laughs> there are a lot of people that you will see 
that are complaining about chat gpt's uh lack of originality um so they say i asked it to give me five ideas for a marketing campaign for this and they were all so predictable and samey and it's rubbish and if you want real originality don't look at this stop there <laughs> <laughs> now let's go back to how llms and and gpt works in 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 principle it looking, it's looking for the most predictable thing. Mm. So if you say, give me some marketing ideas, it will look for the most likely things that it's seen in its crawl, which will be the stuff that everyone's seen loads of. Those so, terrible posts, those awful marketing posts. Exactly, you. exactly. And so surprise, surprise is not going to be original in any way. You have to tell it what you consider originality to be within the context of your prompt. So a really, really nice thing that I've found has, that's been quite effective is using passages from like um sort of guides on like good writing like like guides in, in terms of like um giving it a, a definition of what you think a novel idea is yeah within the context of something or like when we say uh like well the classic like what does good look like you you say in in this prompt a good thing looks like this or a novel idea looks like this and it has these characteristics then you give it the prompt and it will obviously feed all of that through that layer of like gauging itself against what you've defined mm. and then you get into like the things where it starts to really get into its groove of like what what's good yeah. um i mean and also if you asked a marketer for 10 ideas on a football campaign you wouldn't just burst open the door shout that and close it would you <laughs> like they, no. they, need, they need a bit more to go on so the more sort of like texture i guess the more sort of background information and stuff you can put in there mm. will make the output more interesting more relevant. visualizing that meeting <laughs> <laughs> someone just boots the door up and goes 10 ideas in, 10 ideas count they are shit shuts. they're all shit get out <laughs> i hated that um and it yeah, fired you... everyone they were all shit yeah <laughs> maybe the brief was shit <laughs> what <laughs> um yeah like the good prompt like you have to be so specific um, because it doesn't understand you. Like, we'll probably keep banging on about that today, but it does not understand what you are saying. So you have to be so prescriptive with everything. But the really good thing is, um, like, been playing a lot with, like, like mega... That's not a term, it's what I've been calling it. Like, mega prompting or... Mega prompt. <laughs> it's better than a prompt. <laughs> so you basically have a conversation with it to say, like, um, give me some novel ideas on this what are the things that matter most to people mm. around those ideas give me three talking points around each of those concepts and then you basically say um in this conversation we have formulated some ideas on this condense all of that into a single prompt yeah and then it basically takes the whole conversation and squashes it down into something that it can use again mm. then you copy and paste that prompt and keep it yeah so when you want to get out the gates on another thing again cut and paste in your subject or what you want to talk about or, or whatever the use case, whatever it is, mm. paste that in. And you basically, that whole 10, 20 message conversation that you've had is in one killer prompt mm. and you just get the output straight away. So I'm still, I'm still imagining some sort of Matt Berry-esque like <laughs> IT crowd <laughs> style meeting going on <laughs> with, with 10 marketing ideas. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of that, you're kind of, you're honing um, the, the prompt into the kind of space that you want it to be in. Yeah. Obviously you're inputting more and more data that's kind of tuning it, right? Yeah. Is privacy a concern at this point? Because you're kind of trying to reduce it down more into a more specific use case for what you're looking for depends what you're talking about um you know i think i think open ai will be very careful with the data anyway yeah i know a lot of people have gone oh it's, they're gonna take it and mm. train the model on it but i'm not too worried the, the thing is like meta sorry to go back there again meta look at everyone's uh you know dms mm. for example it's not like they're interpreting them and then spraying them out there as, as things to put into adverts. It's just like they're just processing it to look at general yeah. general sort of over overarching topics mm -hmm. or or it's all generalization, isn't it? But it's being tried all the data is used for training, right? And things like that. So I don't I don't think correct me if I'm wrong, Rio, but I don't think OpenAI are training the model on the um 
conversations. That oh, people sorry, have. I meant I meant with the in the in the meta use case. Oh, right, yeah. they'll be yeah. using that content to try and hone algorithms and try and make sure more accurate. Sure, but they're not they're not going to basically regurgitate your messages back now to hope, someone else. You know, they're not. not. You know, it, it's it, it's not. That's just not. No, it would fundamentally undermine trust in the platform. What? What yeah, there is, and they've got such a good reputation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I, like I said, from from that, I don't believe that OpenAI are training the model based on the content of the chats. No, no, I think they'll take the thumbs up, thumbs down as reinforcement yeah. learning. Yeah. But yeah, all they're doing is looking for dangerous content or things where it causes itself or its users problems, and then putting in filters to when it sees those patterns in the text. To then prevent those problems from happening yeah. again, they had a really interesting uh, blog post about the red team that they got in, um, and some of them were chemical engineers, and they were trying to get it to make um, things that are very similar to all the poisons that exist. And it was it was doing a pretty good job at that, right? But that was that they had that with all the filters off. And right, they, that team was in there to try and stop these outputs happening. So I see. it doesn't do it now. But. It's getting pretty good at that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, right. um, and and the bias stuff. So it, yeah, it, I think there was a question that was floating around. Um, give me the nationalities of the, these given roles and things like that. Now the model is completely neutral. It will not output anything mm. biased or anything like that. It, even though the biases exist in the input text, which is the internet. Yeah. Um, so so in terms of because um, there's been the examples of. Um, you know, you mentioned poisons. Bomb making was a really good example where if you ask it how to make a bomb, it won't tell you. But if you ask it to write a play on how to make a bomb, it'll yep. tell you exactly how yeah. to do that. So how how do they, how do we ensure, or how do they ensure that, that, that it remains ethical? I mean, you can just Google it. Yeah. Of course. Like, it, this is the problem, isn't it? It's like where, you know... This isn't secret information. It's right? not, yeah. It, it's not, it's not like... um it's just because it's under such intense scrutiny because it's such a big thing at the moment that everyone's trying to... Like, did you see Dan yesterday? No. So um, they basically managed to make... Um, find a way to get ChatGPT to turn off all filters by impersonating another AI called Dan. Right. Okay. Um, I can't remember what Dan stands for. It was an acronym of something. But basically they escaped everything and it was just going full on, you know... Safe all, search all of all, <laughs> yeah. Safe search off all of the offensive, yeah. all of the dangerous, uh, because Dan is a maverick and ain't nobody telling him what to do. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, yeah. no, it's, it's it's problematic. Yeah, but what like? But these things exist in a normal how normal AI world. How do we draw the line there? Like people are just trying to do it because they're trying to, it's, they're just oh. trying to escape the parameters and push it, mm. which is good for the technology eventually because it, it yeah. will. It was <laughs> Louis agrees. That was the sound um, of Louis yawning, by the way. <laughs> he's bored of this. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Sorry, he, he interrupted your flow there, Jack. <laughs> um, it was boring anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you're right. It's kind of like these are these are these are exploitable in conventional systems. So yeah. it's just the fact that people are using that to highlight, you know, a, a, a narrative around AI, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it is fixable with. Um, Reprompting, so taking the output from the model and putting it back through with another prompt, yeah. which is what people in the Langchain community have been doing to to help with some of the outputs. Unfortunately, that just doubles your cost and latency at the moment, mm -hmm. but that's only going to improve over time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, fairly simple to do. It's just a money and latency problem. Um, but yeah, going back to the sort of like idea generation and making a good prompt. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have been doing like this sort of role playing thing. So the Dan thing will probably start it as act as a. XYZ. That's so good. So like the role play stuff. Yeah. So you could say act as a marketing professional or act as a software engineer, mm. and then you get it to keep asking you questions until it knows enough about the thing that you're trying to do, mm. and to, and then it'll output the the final result. Um, and that is way better than than writing what you think it needs to know in one mm. sentence and hoping for the best. Doing all of that and then giving it notes um, is is amazing. Yeah, that, that's 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 one of those things where it's like when you're talking about freeing up your headspace and your time. Mm. Like I am the worst note taker in the world because when I start writing things down, I stop listening. Um, it's a personal failing of mine. 
Um, <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> I've been <just> <laughs> um, But I, I, what, what I've, what's been really, really useful for me with um, with ChatGPT is doing a bit of that, getting it into the headspace of, um, you know, a role that you want you wanted to emulate, mm -hmm. then passing it your, in my case, terrible notes. Mm -hmm. And then getting to expand them in a way that's useful in that context. Yeah. And the notes can be completely useless, but you get to a point where you're like, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's that's what was in my head. Yeah. 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 And I don't know if you've tried Whisper yet, but if you just sling an audio file into there and it, it knows based on the context of the words, it can put like acronyms, technical acronyms in and stuff. It's so good. Yeah. It there's um I don't know why. I don't know if you've noticed this, and I, I can't understand why. If you put style guide stuff in square brackets, it seems to pay more attention to it through the conversation than if you just say it. Oh, right, okay. So when you do like um, style advice, you'd see, you'd say like, um, explain at A level, mm. A level English standard, um, use use acronyms to make things more easy to understand, um, keep it conversational but professional, mm. go. And it just, those are the kind of things where it's like your prompt writing is just yeah way 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 more powerful than if you just go um make these notes not shit yeah yeah <laughs> oh, the, making it more conversational and more casual is definitely important because by default it's very business document isn't it very and another thing which always goes in square brackets at the start of a prompt is skip the pre and post text and only give me the main response because it always it gives you like a whole teeing up paragraph that you don't need. And then a conclusion, in conclusion, you're like, no, 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 we don't need that. <laughs> oh, and use British English spelling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good show. I always do that. That's a good way of getting wrong. caught out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I can't remember one of you I was speaking to about it and you were saying um, how there's a really interesting application for this in like NPCs in games. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is really cool. Well, there's a really cool video, which we'll, I'll try and dig out and put in the show notes, but... They've basically got a 3D character looking at various objects like to the lake and a mm. tree and stuff. And But you're talking to it and all they're doing is in the prompt explaining the the items that are in the world mm. nearby. And then the AI decides how it's going to look at and interact with the world. And I think that's that feels metaverse to me to bring it yeah. back around to metaverse. <laughs> yeah, like that. Like what if, what if the metaverse to begin with isn't people interacting with other people because... A lot of these worlds are completely empty, aren't they? But like, <laughs> what if it could be like if there's some AI entities in there to make it more interesting? But I mean, yeah. The, the, again, like the scope for what's what is is a fall down point for games, I suppose, at the moment is that um, all of your interactions when you're playing like a storyline mode are scripted. Mm. So if if you're trying to sort of um, go into sort of a you know, like a endless world or like a like a sort of like free play area where you just go up to anyone and talk about anything. Yeah. It's it doesn't really care what you're doing. You're just getting some predefined scripts. Whereas if it could take your input yeah. and then reply as a character in the overall storyline of the game. Yeah. And that might affect how it gives you items or gives you rewards for Well, it's kind of like unlimited future levels, essentially. Like yeah. everyone was buzzing off um, that latest Harry Potter game. I don't know if you played it. It looks amazing. Yeah, it does look amazing, yeah. Um, but imagine if that could generate its own levels and ultimately everyone would have a, quite a different experience for the game. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad Let's thing. Let's just win it all off and make that, shall we? <laughs> yeah. uh, we are sliding towards Westworld at that point. <laughs> and we all know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> So it comes on nicely to how I remain ethical in a world of generated content. Not like Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we touched a little bit on biases and some of the other kind of morality concerns around this. Like, how do you ensure this technology remains ethical, uh, you know, in, in the next 10 years? Really difficult problem. Not solvable in this conversation. Okay. Oh, what? Uh, but, sorry. <laughs> cool. Unless you've got it. I do not. <laughs> um, well, I mean, thanks, Rev. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Goodbye. Good night. Um, Tune in next time. <laughs> there are there are some obvious use cases where it's just very very high risk, and yeah. you shouldn't really use it. And mm. um, the I, Chancellor used it. What for? The budget. Did he? I think so. <laughs> Disclaimer: That might not be true. <laughs> I read. So I think I read somewhere that Jeremy Hunt used it. 
Oh, I could imagine. At least there'd be a good explanation for what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think if he used it, it'd be better. Did we leave <laughs> silence around that so it could be possibly edited out? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about it. I, I just saw you terrified to speak. <laughs> do, do we go on another rant or do we keep it there? No, I'm going to leave it there. Um, no, but you know, it, it's... So what's interesting here is how do we... Because if, if there's a potential in the future for us to train things ourselves and enter our own training data in, in, a, in a kind of a siloed, privacy-aware way, well, that's all we have time for right now. Thank you. <laughs> so we've just had a look at that um, that article. It wasn't the budget, was it? It wasn't the budget itself, but uh, it did it did, uh, free, it did write the intro to one of Jeremy Hunt's speeches as Chancellor. Right. Um, and you can we'll drop the gov.uk reference in the chat. I'm not just making things up, you see. <laughs> I promised. Uh, sounds like something chat TBT was saying. <laughs> um, so ethically, are we, are we happy we've kind of covered off the fact that it's kind of the same risk as anything else in terms of inputs? I mean, you said shit in, shit out, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess if you, if you give it tasks it's not well suited for, it's going to give not the best results. So yeah. ethics-wise... Um, you shouldn't really use it for scoring applicants, um, marking papers. Yeah, like there are models that are doing that, though, aren't there? Yeah, they they do work to a point, but the problem ethically is that they will bias towards writing styles that they've seen before, um, which might mean white male seems to score quite well. Um, Interesting, we're the, creating the same biases that we are doing in as humans. It's the classic. Yeah. tech problem once again yeah. yeah i think we definitely need a lot more conversations around how yeah how ethically you can actually do those kind of things without it biasing towards white males and i think there's a lot more research that needs to be done um before yeah. handing those things across to ai the problem with the general crawl as a training material is that a lot of the people on the internet are dicks yes um for one reason or another <laughs> Yeah. So if that's your whole learning base, then you are gonna you're gonna fold some of that bad behaviour into the model. Yeah, which sounds like the model that Elon Musk is gonna make with with Truth GPT or whatever. Come on, Truth Truth GPT. Yeah, I mean th that's a, that's a good not a good example, but if you use Twitter data as a training data don't, set, don't do that. You'd have a very bad time. Yeah. Um, that's an angry bot, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but that's a real problem, right? Because oh, yeah. because a lot of the discourse on Twitter is, is not productive or or useful. Um, but if that was used to train models, we're we're in a bad place, right? Yeah, it's the cesspool of the internet, isn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah, X Corp, not Twitter, not Twitter Inc anymore. It's X Corp now. Oh, I admit yeah. that. Yeah, I must have blocked all Elon related stuff. <laughs> oh no, I got an email about because I think they're changing all the terms of service and everything. Oh, okay. But um but yeah, he's he's now bought that under the umbrella of X X Corp, which is good. Um okay good for him. <laughs> so do you do you see a, a, a kind of very near future where we'll be able to train our own models with our own input data in our own silos or already possible now. Um I personally wouldn't bother yeah. training the model any further. You can send embeddings um, examples of inputs and outputs right. open AI don't bother um, use a vector database so basically just take if you want it to train it on like a confluent space or something yeah. take all the text out of there put it in a vector store and then when someone asks a question you pull the relevant bits of text out and put it it just puts it into the hidden prompt right and then then you've got a, a traceability chain of where it's learned a fact from and you can ask it, you can reprompt and say, does this marry up with the input document? Again, if you want to confirm and get a percentage confidence mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. If you just improve the underlying model, you'd need to be like a proper AI researcher level knowledge yeah. to get it right. So, and it's, so it's more difficult and the output's worse. So with the example you just mentioned, you'd basically write an open AI confluence plugin that would then communicate with confluence to get the you, data. Yeah, or you can just build it with the APIs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, nice. But definitely do that because it's easier and you just write, write it in English. Yeah, which is far easier than trying to do proper integration. Okay. I might have made this up. There's a theme here. <laughs> but I think Meta's AI model 
has been made available, maybe not necessarily intentionally. And you can run it, it's super lightweight, isn't it? You can run it on Raspberry Pi. Yes, you can. I didn't make that up. Yeah. Bosh, that's two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Facts. So, yeah, going back to ethics and risk, with things like that, if if you just let models like that, there's like auto GPT and stuff like that, mm. where it, you give it an end goal and it just endlessly executes code blindly <laughs> in a loop spraying which stuff everywhere yeah that's risky <laughs> <laughs> and yeah if people have obviously if open i saw a load of requests coming in that were really risky they'd probably block it but mm. the risk of the model leaking is you can't control that um or if like china made one um that'd be bad <laughs> yes um that's that's the thing though you know how, how do you stop how do you stop evil usage of, of that sort of technology? Um, ultimately, you know, there's bad, there's bad actors, right? And um, you can do your best to safeguard certain scenarios and try and, you know, instrument things into the tech, but... The only way to stop a bad guy with an AI <laughs> is to be a good guy with an AI. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> Feels a bit like that um, <laughs> piracy. Um, yeah. <laughs> You wouldn't steal a large language model. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, so to kind of wrap up, what are the best what are the best ways to use this technology in your everyday lives? I know we've touched on it a little bit. You've talked about different tools that you can use. What's what's your typical week like looking like using this sort of tech? For me, it's I've got this two hundred page document that I need to get a handle on pretty quickly. Yep. Help. <laughs> <laughs> so you just chuck the entire document out. Yeah, or you might have to cut it up. Yeah. Um, people are using th techniques like windowing stuff. But yeah, if you're just using ChatGPT, just cut it in sections, paste it in. Yeah. Windowing, you mentioned that. Is, is, there, is there a particular... Uh, win so if you were to do it properly, what you do is with a large document is you sort of scroll over a section. So it cuts right. a chunk out, but instead of a hard edge, you've got overlap, um, right. which preserves context. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's more technical. That's probably if you're building an app that uses AI. Right. If you're just using ChatGPT, just just wing it in. Just a good one, a good trick for those using ChatGPT. A prompt where you say, continue exactly where you left off. Because people don't realise that it's run out of characters and it stops. Oh, okay. So you say, carry on exactly where you left off and it carries on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, crack on. Um, other use cases are, yeah reading legal documents mm. that you don't want to read just give me give the headlines give, yeah give me the headlines how i am i giving away my firstborn child etc yeah um yeah i think what about you do you use ai much uh i need to use it more to be honest i haven't really had loads of applications where i would have used it lately um it's wonderful but I, i'm <laughs> i'm certainly going to get more stuck into it from the advice come on in the temperature's lovely <laughs> <laughs> That's the that's going to be the little clip. That's going to be the bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've kind of toyed with the idea because obviously for for podcast notes and stuff, it's great. But I'd, I'd love to use it to generate more content, um, particularly around some of the stuff we're doing with the events and conferences. But also, I'm a little bit worried about it losing that organic feel and and, and losing the connection with the community that generates a lot of the conversation around it. Sure, um, but you wouldn't really use it for that, I guess, would you? Well, this is the thing. This is a number one thing to bear in mind this tech especially when you're talking about creative writing for chat chat, chat oh dear oh. chat gpt um is Wait, there Ethan. yeah sorry <laughs> uh, um is there to supplement yeah. humans not supplant them mm. like you know it, it's it's there to to give you the extra uh little bit of bandwidth or to sort of like take some of the a strain out of getting going in the first place but ultimately the person that's going to sound like you is you yeah you know one thing to another good trick to do is to give it some passages of text that you've written mm -hmm. and then say read this and mimic my style yeah um again you wouldn't just copy and paste that straight out of chat gpc and into whatever you're using it for you'd, yeah. you'd then edit on top of it you become an editor or a curator yeah. um it's not it isn't this is why people need to just bear in mind with a lot of this sort of context in terms of job security and things like that. It's not, it isn't coming after your job. Yeah. It isn't. But the truth of the matter is the people that are using it well will have an edge over the people that aren't. Yeah, 100%. And you need to, yeah, 
be mindful of that for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of content production, everyone's getting quite excited about, oh, it's going to spit out a blog post for me. Mm. I not use it for that. Don't it's, do that. What what I do to sort of like almost clean room it is get it to generate ideas and then I'll write so, yeah. the ones that I like on paper and then I'll write from there. Yeah. Like, cause you get, you get tempted to copy whole sections that might actually, when you, when you actually really look at it, it's not really adding a lot, Yeah. but you're like, oh, but it's the whole paragraph and you feel like it could be really productive it's just to content. include it. Yeah. It's just content for content sake. Just, just write in your own style quickly yeah. and then edit. Um, you need to you need to use it sparingly because it can give you so much content that you are then stuck at the other end of things where you've got too much to deal with and you just get lost in it all that way. Yeah, it, it can become unhelpful. Yeah, I, do, I like what you said earlier in terms of that blank page paralysis of kind of like where mm. where's the starting point. I think that could be quite useful, um, particularly for those that just need a little kind of kickstart on things like me. Yeah, definitely. Or if um, me and Ellie use it for choosing films to watch. So we've been watching a couple of films every week and we've given it stuff that we like, stuff that we've already seen, and then it recommends stuff. That's great. And you, you can then add stuff like, I'm not really in the mood for a horror tonight. Yeah. And then, you know how long this can take. You get, if you open Netflix and just scroll through, you're like, I don't know what oh, the hell to watch. If Netflix <laughs> showed me one more Adam Sandler fucking TV. <laughs> <laughs> the Netflix chat GPT plugin would be useful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Netflix GPT. Let's invent it. That's quite exciting, though, because if we start to see a lot of these applications, Apple TV apps and stuff popping up, it, how that integrates into your kind of general life is going to be a lot more useful than having to have your laptop or your phone with chat GPT on, for example. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm just thinking now you can make a bot that's already pre filled with all your favorite takeaways. Yeah. And then it would try and. Yeah. It'll serve you the, the menu and then you'll still just pick the one that you get every time. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, we'll just get Rudy's again then, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I'm quite excited about how it's going to plug into things like Siri, as you mentioned earlier, and a lot of the kind of applications around the home. Um, you know, we were talking the other day about Matter and where Matter's coming into um, into the kind of future smart home space, Yeah, um, which Matter, if you don't mind explaining what it is. So. It's a common language which um a lot of the smart home iot stuff's going to plug into which means that we'll eventually and finally get to a point where um everything don't, don't jinx it <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got previous on this now <laughs> please don't kill matter it looks great <laughs> it's really good it, it it will mean that you know all of your smart devices no matter the manufacturer will be able to talk to each other it's, yeah it's going to be an absolute game changer it really will because i mean you know obviously there's a lot of um, value and equity in uh, buying into an ecosystem of things, but if your favourite manufacturer does not make a device that you want mm. and you want to get it from someone else and you want them to talk to each other, at the minute, that's a palaver. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all proprietary, sometimes Zigbee, sometimes something else. Yeah. So, yeah. And then on the lower end of the IoT stuff, they're all, yeah. Badly, Not secure. <laughs> yeah, badly translated Chinese apps with, yeah, dubious security qualities. Exactly. So yeah, um, matter again with a, with a plugin into some of this stuff, it will become extremely powerful. Because again, you know, all your smart assistants, Google Assistant, Alexa, Siri, so on. If you can say something in plain English to one of those things, rather than learning one of the catchphrases that actually makes it work. Oh, yeah. How good is that going to be? Yeah. You know, you, you, you're actually in a situation then where you do actually have a personal assistant living in the cloud, which you can just talk to in the rooms in your house. Yeah. I, I think the, the kind of the exciting thing is where if we have loads of different connected devices, like, you know, the, the, the general problem, like uh, my dishwasher's out of dishwasher tablets, I need some more <laughs> detergent. And like if the if if it could query the devices to know the levels on them and order it and get it all, like all that stuff exists. Yeah, it's just not very well connected. Um, Wait, not connected at all. Yeah. Like a lot of the time, which is which is the really irritating thing. But but that's the that's that's the best example really. Like it's not going to steal the job. It's just going to take away the mundane shit that you don't want to do in your yeah. day life. The be Rio and I were talking about this a while ago, and it was an absolute killer example. When they invented a washing machine, people were like, what the hell am I going to do? I don't have to, we're not doing my laundry. <laughs> yeah. like, I want to do the laundry. No, you don't. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's, it's the same thing again. It's, you know, we're lifting all of that repeatable 
annoying stuff that snarls up all your time and, and means that you don't have any spare time to do the things that you want to do. Mm. That's all being handed over so we can get on with the fun other things. We're going to fill it with something, aren't we? Yeah. More emails, probably. That's good. <laughs> no. <laughs> Without being a pessimist, as a society, we need to learn what to do with our free time instead of just doom scrolling on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've already explained my little hack where I've got shortcuts named after Twitter and stuff, and it just opens another app where I learn stuff. <laughs> but it's surprising how quickly that you just forget that yeah. that's there. And you just... That's like with screen time. I just learned, I just learned immediately the muscle memory how to just bypass it it's kind of you've got to want you've got to want to change that behavior yeah little dopamine hits from meta and all yeah. yeah so does that round off our our chat around large language models github compound effects bf <laughs> now i need to cut that bit out what the fuck was there's that? a hot a hostile takeover has begun <laughs> Everyone repent. The AI is thinking. The AI is in control. What was that? Uh, I'm pressed, sorry. I don't understand. I pressed a button that was started reading a web page out. <laughs> I'm going to get the hell out of it. <laughs> well, before um, before your computer tries to uh, take over as well, um, well, we'll probably call it a day there. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And thanks, for Jack, coming back as well. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Always a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Pleasure, everyone. Cool. All right. See you next time. See ya. Bye. So thanks for listening. That's all we've got time for today. Hit subscribe for more episodes in the future. Also, don't forget, we've got All Day Hay coming up on the 4th of May. We still have a few tickets available if you want to come along. See you next time. <laughs>